Jesus, we worship you, we love you, sir. Yes, Thank Lord. God that you're here in our midst. God, I pray that you would manifest yourself today in the name of Jesus. I pray that you would touch lives, heart, soul of God, that you meet us where we are. And you would reach down and touch us, God. I pray for healing of emotions, healing of hurts and scars and wounds of the past. I pray for new thought pathways, new uh, neural pathways to be in our brain, new plasticity, God. <coughs> that you would cause us to think new thoughts, your thoughts. I pray that you would seal it today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, like I said, uh, in the first service, and if you guys have ever seen me before, I kind of like start off slow, and I kind of pick up going as we're going. Uh, I just kind of like to feel what's going on and kind of sense what the Lord wants to do, because it's really it's all about Him. Uh, thank you guys for coming out. Thank you, I see Fletcher. Thank you guys. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I really want to know what God has to say, what God wants to do. So, um, yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise uh, you. Really. So, today is Father's Day, you know? So, uh, that's pretty awesome. Because when Matt asked me to, uh, to share... Um, I really didn't know, like, I mean, when he asked me to, I knew it was Father's Day, but I already had something that he had, the Lord had given me for you guys uh, about a month ago, and knowing that Matt was going to ask me soon, he mentioned it, but I didn't really know when, so those Father's Day, I thought, how appropriate that this message is for Father's Day, because we're going to talk about um, God is our Father. Amen. 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 So, um, I hope you all brought your Bibles. Uh, I like... I like my Bible. I like to read my Bible. It's always good. I'm disappointed when I go somewhere and then I need my Bible and I to open it up, you know? So we're going to do something different, you know? Um, yeah, hold your Bible up. You got your Bible? Say, this is my Bible. This is my Bible. I have what it says I have. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. I can do what it says I can do. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Let's uh, open up in your Bible to Ephesians chapter 1. You know, the idea and concept that God is our Father is not really a new concept because uh, you know, the, the, the Jewish people believe that. In the Old Testament, it talks about God being our Father, but not necessarily the same way as Jesus introduced it. Jesus introduced God as being a personal, real, intimate Father. Uh, that was kind of a new concept. Matter of fact, it's one of the reasons why the Jews wanted to kill him because, you know, he made himself out to be like a family member of God. They said that they wanted to kill him because he made himself out equal with God because he's called God his Father. Right. Now in our minds that really doesn't make much sense, but hopefully by the end of the service today, it'll make more sense to you. You know? Because you read that, sometimes we read stuff. I want to please ask you at this time to silence your cell phones mm -hmm. if you haven't done so already. Okay. <laughs> 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 Sound familiar? <laughs> Before we get started, we have a few simple guidelines. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, um, so it really wasn't a new idea that God was our Father, but the, the way that God interacted, the way that Jesus introduced was new. And they wanted to kill him because when he said God was his Father, they thought they were, they were making themselves equal with God, so they wanted to kill him for that. In Ephesians chapter 1, Starting in verse 3, I believe. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the pleasure of his good will. So, I mean, there's a couple things in this verse that I think are really awesome. The first one is that um, God wanted to have children. You know, it says that, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he chose us in him to be predestined as sons. God wanted children. And so because he wanted children, he did a couple things. Uh, the first one 
is that he created Adam and Eve. And that kind of set everything in, in motion. Uh, and Adam was called the son of God. And if you read through there in the genealogies, I believe it's in the book of Luke, where it talks about Adam being the son of God. He says so-and-so is the son of so-and-so, so-and-so, son of so-and-so, right? They draw all, all the genealogy from Jesus all the way back. They go, and Luke goes all the way back to Adam, and he says Adam is the son of God. So, that may not mean anything yet, but you'll get to it. But he says here that he put us his adoptions by son and Jesus Christ to himself. The other verse I want to look at here is in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 and verse 15 says that this, For you did not receive the spirit of a bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry out, Abba, Father. So there's a couple of things I want to point out about this verse. So God's given us the spirit of adoption. And then he says we cry out, Abba, Father. So I want to talk a little bit about adoption. So the, the idea of adoption in our society is a lot different than what adoption was in the Hebrew culture or even in the Roman or Greek culture when the New Testament was written. In the Hebrew culture, they didn't really have an idea of adoption. There was no adoption. So when someone was part of a family, they were just part of a family. They didn't adopt them. They just took them in as part of a family, and they were equal heirs with that family. The idea of adoption was actually introduced by the Romans. And in our society, adoption is like, um, you know, you have someone who is unwanted. Maybe you have a person who is a teenager and has a child. They want to give the child for adoption. Uh, not that they don't necessarily love the child, but they can't afford it. They don't want it. Um, or maybe there's some other problem, or maybe you just can't afford it, or maybe the child gets taken away, and so they put these children up for adoption. Are you tracking me so far? Yes. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. That's kind of our society. It's kind of like um, there's a problem, so we've got to get rid of this child. Um, that is really our culture. That's not how it was in the Greek or Roman time. So a little bit of history, when we understand like how the Bible was written and what was going on during that time, it helps us to understand what these terminologies and these words mean. So during the, uh, the time of the Bible being written, the time that this was written here in, in Romans, the Roman Empire was in charge of the known world at the time. They just seceded the Greeks. Alexander the Great conquered the world and introduced Greek and Greek thought, Greek culture to the whole world. So everybody spoke Greek. They were educated, which created the platform for the Roman culture to come in and the Roman culture was to pox Romano, make everything like Rome. It was to establish a kingdom. So we see God at work here, actually. This is a little history lesson, I guess. I love history, but it's a little history lesson. So had the Greeks, had Alexander the Great not conquered the world at the time and introduced Greek thought and Greek culture and introduced the importance of education and the importance of, of higher learning and doing better and this kind of thought or deeper thinking and philosophy then it would not have set the tone for when the Romans came and conquered. Because the Romans came and built upon that. Are you tracking me? Am I, am I like any other history nerds in here or just me? <laughs> so, so the Romans uh, conquered the Greeks and they built upon that platform. And so these people now were educated. They knew how to read. They, they understood philosophy and some of these higher concept thoughts. And they wanted to better themselves. So when the Romans came in, the Romans, they took control, and they were going to make everything like Rome. Yes. And that's what Pax Romano means, everything like Rome. It was a kingdom. It was a basilea. In the Greek New Testament, Jesus said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Mm -hmm. The word kingdom is a Roman term. It's not a Jewish term. It's transliterated into Greek as basilea, but the concept and idea was everything like the kingdom, Pax Romano. So when you would go into Ephesus, Ephesus would be just like Rome. There would be a government and a structure the way it was. There would be a, uh, the senators or whatever it was. Whatever was governing that city, the way they did it was exactly in every city that the Romans had. It was exactly the same. Right? Pax Romano. So in, and it was supposed to be like Rome, as if Caesar was sitting on the throne in Ephesus just like he was in Rome. Right? That's how it was. So when Jesus said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, 
He was saying, repent, because he wants his kingdom to be Pax yes. Heaven, yes. not Pax Roman. Yes. Right? Uh -huh. Not Pax Romana, but Pax Heaven. Everything's going to be like the kingdom of heaven. Mm -hmm. Repent, which means change the way you think. Mm -hmm. Change the way you think. Think differently. God has a kingdom, and his kingdom's here, and he wants his kingdom to be established. He wants everything to be like this. So if you went into Ephesus, it, whatever was happening in Rome was going to be in Ephesus. Because it was a mini Ephesus. I mean, a mini Rome in Ephesus. <laughs> Same thing with, with uh, Thessalonica, Thessalonica or Galatia. Wherever they went, it was going to be the same thing in every place with Rome being the center, right? Yeah. That's how it is with us with the kingdom. You know, God wants his kingdom established here on this earth mm -hmm. just like it is in heaven. Mm -hmm. That's good. Come thy kingdom, be done thy will, on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Thy kingdom, pox heaven, thy kingdom, kingdom come. All right. That horse is dead. So, <laughs> so adoption. The Romans introduced this idea of adoption that was different. So the Hebrews didn't have adoption. So if you know the story of Abraham... Abram had an heir who was Eleazar, who wasn't an heir. Eleazar of Damascus, he was one of his servants. But he was up in, his, in you know, one of his higher servants, and he trusted him. And so Abram made Eleazar his heir because he had no children. God said, hey, I'm going to bless you as the stars of the, of the heavens. I'm going to bless you as the sand of the sea. But he had no kids. So Abram's like, well, how am I going to have all these nations? Um... Eliezer, you're going to be my heir, okay? And whoever comes from your family now is Abraham's family, okay? Mm -hmm. And that's what he did. That was the Jewish mindset, and when Eliezer came into Abraham's family, he was an heir. He was not a second-class citizen. He was an heir now because he made him an heir. The Romans introduced this idea that was different. And that was that in order to be adopted... You had to be an adult, and you had to agree to it, and you had to verbally say it. So unlike today, like if you have a, a baby that gets dropped off on a church doorstep or a hospital or something like that, and they go into the system and someone adopts them, that child has no control over what happens to them, right? And, you know, we're trying to be gracious and help and have mercy and help some, some innocent child. But that wasn't the term of adoption that the, the Hebrew mindset has. And it wasn't the term of adoption that the Romans had. The Romans introduced this concept that was you voluntarily place yourself into another person's family. You agree with your mouth, they agree with their mouth. It was like a covenant or a contract. Now, in this custom... In the eyes of the law, according to Roman culture, when you became adopted, you became a new creature, a new creation mm -hmm. that had never existed before. And all things became new, and all things passed away. And you were into a new family, born again into that family. That was a Roman concept. Have you ever heard those kind of words or terminology before in church? Yes. Yes. I'm reminded of 2 Corinthians 5.17. Right? If anyone's in Christ, he's yes. a new creation. creation. All things have passed away. All things have become new. Right? Yes. Jesus said you must be born again. So Jesus, you know, he wasn't stupid. And, you know, Paul wasn't stupid either. You know, and the thing that Paul was writing to, he wrote to the Romans. It was a Roman concept that he wrote to the Romans. And he said, hey, you want to have the spirit of adoption as sons. So he's talking to them in a, under, a way that they understand. So it doesn't make sense to us today, this idea of adoption. We think of a little baby. Mm -hmm. That's not what they were doing. They are saying, you're going to make an agreement. You're going to make a covenant together, right? And you're going to come in agreement. You're going to say, yes, I want to be part of your family. Yes, I want you part of my family. Now you're part of the family. Whatever you did before is gone. You are now this new family. 
And you're an heir in this new family. You're born again into this family. Right? You have a yeah. new name. Yeah. You ever heard that before? Yes. Amen. So, that's the idea and backdrop behind what's going on here when Paul is writing this. And what's going on in the New Testament culture that we're reading these terminology for. So Paul wasn't just saying, oh, if you're in Christ, you're a new creation that never existed. Like, this was some kind of new concept that never heard before. No, they understood exactly what he meant. You're saying, I'm adopted. I have a new family. I have an inheritance. Yes. That's what they were saying. I am a son. I have rights now. I'm not just a slave. That's good. Thank you. I think it was too. <laughs> so then, <laughs> it's kind of warm in here, man. I haven't, I haven't even got my hoop up yet. So, <laughs> so then he says, you know, spirit of adoption whereby we can cry, Abba, Father. Now this Abba, Father is a new concept too. This is not in Hebrew at all. You won't see Abba, Father anywhere. Matter of fact, it's only mentioned three times in the New Testament. And only mentioned by Paul and John Mark, who was a student of Paul's, or a disciple of Paul's. Traveled with him and Barnabas. So it really is a Pauline thought. You know, Paul is a very educated man. If you don't know this about Paul, I'm going to share with you because I'm a history nerd, right? Paul was a Pharisee of Pharisees. Now, in order to be a Pharisee, you had to, understand, you had to be able to quote verbatim the first five books right. of the New Testament, the Pentateuch. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Genesis, Exodus, I'm pretty good on Deuteronomy. You get Leviticus, man? <laughs> like, <laughs> So I can't even say them names, let alone who begat, who begat, who begat, who begat, you know? And then by the, by the wife of so-and-so and by the concubine of so-and-so, and then they have three kids. I'm like, whoa. So I'm just saying, they had to be studied and learned, right? Just to be a Pharisee. There's a reason why the Pharisees were a little arrogant, or a lot arrogant, and had a lot of pride. I mean, there's a lot of work in there. I mean, just to be able to quote one book of the Bible, even just the New Testament book that's, you know, Six chapters, let alone 50 chapters, Genesis. I mean, verbatim, right? Reminds me of that movie, Book of Eli. Did you guys see that movie, Book of Eli? Oh, yeah. And he gets to the end, he starts quoting in the beginning. You know, yeah. like, woo! I mean, that convicted me. Like, dude, the, the whole rest of the world is going to be based on this guy quoting the Bible so they can put it in print so everybody else can read it. Yes. That's, like, out there. So anyway... Good movie, though. Yeah, it was a good movie. That was good. Um, so, <laughs> so uh, I forgot where I was at, but that's okay. I digress. So, the idea of a father. Huh? Pharisees. Pharisees, yes, thank you. So, they, someone's listening. All right. So, the Pharisees, first five books of the Bible that I had to memorize, Paul, you know, was a Pharisee of Pharisees. So, there's like this pecking order. So, he was a teacher of the Pharisees, mm -hmm. not just a Pharisee. Matter of fact, it says later in Galatians that he was next in line for Gamaliel's council. Gamaliel was a high priest. So he was like in line in his tribe, right? Because it had to be succession, it had to be by birth. He was next in line to be high priest over the people. Right? right? Mm -hmm. He was very excited to Fulfill God's plan. I'll say yeah. it that way. Yeah. <laughs> and how he understood it. So he, this is this is a guy who's learned. He's educated. So he knew what he was talking about. So he's talking in terms that these people understand. That's the whole point I'm trying to make. Is that when he's talking about adoption, he's talking in a terminology that the people of the time understood. He said, we want you to have the spirit of adoption whereby you could be, say, Abba, Father. And then understanding at the time, those people knew what he meant when he said adoption. They had to have someone like me come up here and explain to them that it means you're a new creature, your old life has passed away, you have a new life, you're born again into a new family. This is the concept Jesus was trying to introduce too, right? Jewish people didn't like it, right? They want no, we want to stick with our Jewish customs. If Jesus come, this is the Jewish custom, I'm just saying it in a way that people understand, right? How many people here speak Aramaic? No, no, just kidding. 
<laughs> We're speaking in English today, right? American English at that. I mean, don't have any Brits here. I mean, like, we're talking American English. They don't even call us English anymore, right? So uh, we speak in the language we understand of our times. So another thing about being adopted is when you become adopted, yes, you have a new name, right? You've got old things passed away. You're born again into a new family. Mm -hmm. Part of that being born again into a new family means that you get the benefits of that. One of them is a birthright. Mm -hmm. Does that mean anything to anybody? Mm -hmm. Yeah? So we have some people who are studying birthright. Okay. Most of us don't understand what birthright means. And I, I have a cursory understanding of it, but I am not born into a prominent family. I don't come from a wealthy family. Birthright doesn't mean a whole lot to me, right? Other than I understand the concept of it, knowledge, but not experientially. Right. You agree with me? Right. I come from a very normal American family that's very dysfunctional and broken. Can I get a witness? Birthright means nothing to me experientially. But to the Jewish people, Birthright was everything. Birthright meant that you had an inheritance. It meant that you, as the, the birthright of the firstborn, you got a double portion of the blessing, a double portion of the inheritance, and you became the executor of the estate. And then you carried on that name of your family and perpetuated it generation to generation to generation. So, what does that mean? For the Jews, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, right? Mm -hmm. When you look at these things, they're the son of Jacob, who was the son of Isaac, who was the son of Abraham, right? Mm -hmm. That's what it means that there's this genealogy, there's this history and lineage of birthright, of succession, of history there that carries on. That's what the birthright is. And the birthright was important to them. Esau sold his birthright mm -hmm. for some stew, right? Yeah. right? And the way he sold it was with his mouth. He gave away his birthright. And the Hebrews tells us, I believe it's Hebrews, that later he regretted it and he wanted it back. But he couldn't get it no matter how hard he tried. He gave away his birthright for a bowl of soup. And this is what's caused the problem between the Jews and the Arabs ever since. Right? They both claim Abraham as their father. <coughs> the Arabs claim Abraham as their father through Ishmael, who was the firstborn male son of Abraham. The Jews came Abraham as their father through Isaac, who was the child of the promise. Right. And then it says that we see then that those of the flesh persecuted those of the promise yeah. later on. Mm -hmm. And this war is going on throughout mm -hmm. history because they're both won the birthright. They're fighting over a little sliver yes. of land. Yes. <laughs> right? Yes. And it doesn't matter that they take a different piece of land or a different piece of land. They want the promise. They want the birthright. They want their inheritance. I feel like I'm getting way ahead of myself. So, that's what the whole thing is all about. The birthright. Who has legal access to this land? Who has the right to receive the inheritance? If we go back to Genesis, we talked about God wanting to have a family. Genesis 1.26 says that God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them have dominion over the earth. I'm kind of summarizing it. But that's basically what it's all about. You know, we saw in Ephesians that God wanted children. And so he, he chose and predestined us to adopt his sons through Jesus Christ. But he made Adam who to be his son in the beginning. Right? That's right. 
Alright. That wasn't rhetorical. So in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, it says that God formed Adam out of the dust of the ground. Everything else God spoke. Let there be sun, let there be moon, let there be stars, let there be mountains, let there be water, let there be trees, let there be fish, let there be animals, let there be cattle, let there be waters that separate the waters, and let there be day and night. But when it came to man, he formed him. A little more intimate. And then after he formed him, it says he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. God breathed his spirit into Adam. Gave him life. And we have that life and it's carried on to this day. That we are eternal beings. We are eternal beings because we have the breath of God in us. Amen. 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 Mm. Amen. Woo. Amen. Woo. We got the breath of God in us. That's why we're eternal. That's why we're different from yes. animals, yes. plants, yes. whatever. Yes. Right? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> 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 Hallelujah. So we have that breath of God in us. It's, a, it's different. Now, the problem is, Adam and Eve sin. God said, don't eat of the fruit, and they eat of the fruit. It doesn't matter that they were tricked and deceived. It doesn't matter that Eve didn't really understand what God said because she misquoted it. They sinned. Yep. God said, the day that you eat of that fruit, you will surely die. Mm -hmm. Not die, you'll surely die. Mm -hmm. But we know, don't we, that they didn't drop down dead after right. they ate that fruit. As a matter of fact, God came looking for them. Now, this is going to crack some of your theology, I'm sure, but um, if you look at Genesis chapter 3, and verse 7 says, they, well, verse 6, they ate the fruit. Verse 7, their eyes were open, they realized they were naked, and they put fig leaves on, trying to cover themselves up. And verse 8 says, they heard the sound of the Lord God doing what? Walking. Walking in the garden. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees in the garden. So, and the Lord God called Adam, where are you? And he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. So let's get a picture of what's really happening here, okay? Adam and Eve sinned, right? They ate the fruit. All of a sudden, oh my God, we're naked. <laughs> you know, they lost their glory, right? The glory of God that was on them, and all of a sudden they realized, oh my God, we're naked. You're naked. Oh, what's that? Oh my goodness. Let's get some fig leaves and cover ourselves up. <laughs> and in the process of doing this, they heard God walking in the garden. So it was, if you, if you read that in the Hebrew, it's, it, was like, it was like it was his custom. Like God was coming at the time he normally came to meet with Adam. Mm. Okay? And he's like, and you know, hey Adam, I'm here, where are you? Uh -huh. Adam's like, oh, I hid myself. So, like, we read this, and, like, we just kind of read through it. Like, it's like a rolling stop <laughs> sign or something, right? Like a, a Hollywood stop, right? That's not what this is about. He's saying, God came looking for Adam in the midst of his sin. Mm hmm. God came looking for Adam in the midst of his sin. Adam was trying to hide. He was trying to cover his sin up and then trying to hide because he realized that covering up wasn't enough. Right? Right. And he tried to hide in the trees. Not the smartest guy, okay? <laughs> but God didn't know where he was or God didn't know what he was doing. And God knew the whole time. But he was giving Adam a chance to come clean. <laughs> Adam, I'm here. Where are you? This is our, you know, point in time. And thank God Adam didn't, like, just be quiet and, like, escape or run away. He says, God, here I am. I'm sorry. You know, I was hiding because I was naked. Well, who told you you were naked? I didn't tell you you were naked. Did you eat the fruit I told you not to? So do you see what's happening here? I mean, the religion tells us that, you know, like, 
God was walking in the garden and Adam was there. Adam is sin. God came to sin. And even though God told him, and the day you eat it, you'll surely die, he didn't drop down dead when God's presence was in front of him either. So this idea that, you know, we're going to drop down dead if we're in God's presence, I mean, it, it comes from the law and the temple and all that kind of stuff. And yes, it happened to some people, but it didn't happen to Moses. It didn't happen to Abram. It didn't happen to uh, Jacob when he wrestled with God. It didn't happen to Elijah. Right? God showed himself a lot to people. And they didn't drop down dead. Okay? God comes looking for us in our sin. Because he's a good God. Yes. And he didn't just get good after Jesus died. He was good the whole time. I say he didn't just get good after Jesus died. He was good the whole time. Amen. I don't think you guys heard me. I said he didn't just get good after Jesus died. He was good the whole time. Amen. I think you're starting to get it. God is good. He was good in the garden. So then God says, you know, you ate of the fruit. He says, yeah, you know, the woman gave it to me. And he goes to the woman, oh, the serpent gave it to me. We know that, right? We're not going to go there. So then he deals with the serpent. Okay, you're going you're gonna to crawl around, slither on your, head, on, your, on your belly for the rest of your life. And you're going to try to get my seed. There's going to be a seed come from the woman. And you're going to try and hurt him. But he's going to crush your head. And in the process of crushing your head, he's going to hit you so hard, he's going to bruise his heel. That's what the Hebrew says there. And then he comes to Adam and says, okay, Adam, you're going to toil labor. But then if we go down and we look at verse 21. And sometimes, you know, we read these verses and we just kind of read through them. Like, in verse 21 says... And also, for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. Mm -hmm. whoop de woo what's that mean? Mm -hmm. This is the first shedding of blood to cover sin in the Bible. These tunics of skin had to come from somewhere. They came from some animals that God killed and made a sacrifice to cover the sin with their blood. Hebrews 9.22 says that without the remission, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And that everything, every sin has to be covered by blood somehow. So God, in the very beginning, he shed the animal and he put the skin over them. He covered their sin. He covered their sin. God wasn't trying to get them. They didn't drop down dead right then. They had the life of God in them. They were eternal beings. So he had to kick them out of the garden. Because if they continued to eat of that tree of life, they'd live forever in a fallen state. So it was his mercy that put them out of the garden. So that eventually, a Messiah could come. All right. I'm working myself up here. <laughs> So then we, we, we see that this seed, so God introduces this idea of a seed that's coming from the woman. And there's going to be a seed come from the woman, and this seed is going to crush the devil's head. And when he crushes the devil's head, he's going to stomp him so hard that he's going to bruise his heel. Now this seed is what God talks to Abraham about in Genesis chapter 12. He tells him, okay... You're going to have the, a, a descendant that's going to come from you is going to rule the nations. And all nations are going to come out of you, as, as many as the descendants of the sand of the sea and the stars of the air. And then in chapter 15, Abram says, look, God, I don't have a seed yet. And the only one I have is this Eliezer of Damascus, the servant of mine that I've adopted in my home under the code of Hammurabi, which was what, what the law was in Mesopotamia where Abram came from, but doesn't mean anything. Anyway, so, um, yeah. So he says, also I have this Eliezer of Damascus, and God says, no, you're going to have a seed that's going to come out of you. You're going to have a seed that's going to come from you and Sarah, and that seed is the child of promise. 
Now, Acts chapter 7, if you'll turn there with me. Are you with me? Yes. 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 Who's gone home already? <laughs> I am home. <laughs> Amen. Acts chapter 7 in verse 2. And this is Stephen's address. He says, Brethren and fathers, listen. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran. And said to him, Get out of your country and from your relatives and come to a land I will show you. And he came to the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Haran. And from there, when his father was dead, he moved him to this land in which you now dwell. And God said to him, and God gave him no inheritance in it, not even enough to set his foot on, but even when Abraham had no child, say no child, no. Abraham had no child, he promised to give him for a possession and to his descendants after him. See, this is how God does things, right? Yeah. He's like, Abraham had no child, and Abraham's trying to get a child, so he tries with Eleazar, which God says no, then he tries through Ishmael, and God says no, right? But he said, you're still going to have a promise. And then it goes down to verse 8, and he gave him a covenant of circumcision, and so Abraham begot Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day, and Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot the twelve patriarchs. Mm -hmm. So this shows us that part of their way into their covenant, into their birthright, was circumcision. Right? Mm -hmm. And if you understand anything about the Jewish custom, right, the males had to be circumcised on the eighth day. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then by being circumcised, you were able to enter into the covenant, into the birthright, into the inheritance. But if you were not a male child, guess what? Zippo. <laughs> That's just the way it was, right? Yeah. We'll come back to that. So in Galatians chapter 3, actually we'll come back to it right now. Galatians chapter 3. I, I love Galatians 3. This, this, this chapter is just filled with so much stuff. So in verse 16, now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say unto seeds as many, but as to one, as to your seed, who is Christ. So the inheritance, verse 18 of the law, is no longer a promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. So like what he's saying here is that we see in Genesis chapter 3 that there was a seed that was going to come from the woman, and then Abraham got this promise of the seed, and everyone's thinking that all it's all going to be through Abraham's lineage, but he's saying, no, 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 no. I was talking about Christ the whole time. Yeah. I was talking about Christ, and I'm going to come through his seed. Mm -hmm. And then he goes on, and he says here, mm -hmm. in verse 26 and 29, For you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And there is neither Jew nor Greek nor male nor female nor slave nor free, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. So what Paul's saying here is, listen, under the old covenant of Abraham, in order to be Abraham's seed, you had to be a male, and then you had to be firstborn to get that birthright. If you weren't the firstborn, then you weren't the birthright. So you had to be firstborn to get the birthright. Then you had to be male, and you had to be circumcised on the eighth day. What he's saying here now is, by faith in Jesus, we're all sons of God. Amen. Right. Amen. I know some newer translations say children of God, and, and that's okay. That's, that's what it means there. But I like the rendition of sons of God because then it helps you to see every other place where it says sons of God, it's applying to you too. Yeah. So yeah. that means that... <laughs> yeah. So that means that, you know, women are included. Right? I mean, we understand that, but we have to understand that what Jesus was saying. You know, Jesus was the one who liberated women. You know, it was right. the Hebrew culture and the Roman culture that made women second class. Mm -hmm. And Jesus came and said, no, 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 no. We're all one in Christ. If you're in Christ by faith in Jesus, mm -hmm. you are a son of God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you have a right to the promise mm -hmm. that God made to Abraham. Not just the male firstborn Jews. All right. So... Let's talk about inheritance for a minute. What is an inheritance? Again, 
if you've come from a family of a lot of money or royalty or nobility, this means a lot more to you. I don't. So to me, it didn't really mean anything. You know, inheritance, woo, you know. My parents <laughs> passed away and, you know, you got a little bit of money. That's not what the Jewish custom was. In the Jewish custom, I mean, you, they passed on their inheritance from generation to generation to generation to generation, and it grew. So maybe in our country, you might think of people like Rockefeller. Yes. Right? Huh. This, this is a name of people who passed on wealth from one generation to another generation to another generation. There's like, uh, I can't remember all the ones, but I think modern Bill Gates, you know? Steve Jobs, right? Their money is passed on from family to family to family to family, right? They built an inheritance for their family. So that's what it, this is talking about. The other thing is Hebrews chapter 9 talks about how that an inheritance is only in effect when the person who has it dies. So if the person, they call it, Hebrews says the testator. So if the, the, the will or the inheritance only comes into effect once the person who has it passes away and they pass it on to the next person. Because when the person is still alive, there is no need for a testator. There's no need for the inheritance because they still have it. So Bill Gates' money stays with Bill Gates until Bill Gates dies. When Bill Gates dies, it goes on to his heirs. They don't get it until he dies. Does that make sense? That's what he's saying here, right? And you're like, well, what the heck does that have to do with anything? Well, Jesus gave us the promise through faith in him. So we needed our testator to die so we can receive the inheritance. Mm -hmm. Guess what, folks? Jesus died. Yes. Yes. Amen. And he rose from the dead. He's still alive for more, but he did die. So once he died, then the will came into effect. Of course, he rose, he rose again from the dead, but it doesn't change the fact and nullify that that was already put into place. Some you're gonna wake up in the middle of the night going, that's what he was saying. Oh, oh, I just hit myself way too hard before him. <laughs> Could have had a V8. So <laughs> we have an inheritance, folks. I guess that's the point. We have an inheritance. Amen. And according by law, we needed the testator to die so that the inheritance can be passed on to us. Mm -hmm. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 12 says this. We give thanks to God our Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. We have an inheritance with other saints in the light. So once we become a saint, we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, we have an inheritance. Oh, I forgot to mention this. Just come back to me. So part of, of the adoption and part of the birthright... I'll go back to the birthright. So one of the things about the birthright is that in their custom, the person who was uh, the firstborn was also referred to as the first begotten or sometimes the only begotten. Mm -hmm. So when, when the Bible says that God gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him would not perish but have everlasting life, he wasn't just throwing this thing out like this is God's you know, only begotten son that no one else was ever born of God because Adam was born of God. Mm -hmm. What it was saying is that according to their custom and their birthright, he was talking in terms they understood. That this is a person who had the birthright from God. He was the firstborn with the inheritance from God. That's what he was saying. Now, when we understand what birthright means, we understand what adoption means, these terms that we read in the Bible make more sense. Yes. yes. So when he says that the only begotten son, he was saying this is the firstborn. This is the heir. This is the one with the promise. And God gave his firstborn, only begotten son, his firstborn. 
He gave us the inheritance. So when we read verses like Colossians 1.12, that we have an inheritance with God, it seems to make more sense. Or if we read over in Ephesians, and this one uh, just dawned on me like last night. I was like, oh my God, I never saw this before. <coughs> Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11 says that to him we have also obtained an inheritance being predestined according to his purpose, according to his will. It was God's will for us to be predestined yes. to be yes. sons of God. Yes. Not that God has predestined our life and the rest of our path for us. No. He predestined or he predetermined from the foundation of the earth in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, when he introduced the seed and that concept and that thought, he predestined us, you and me, you and 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 all y'all, to be sons of God with a birthright and an inheritance. Praise him. And then in verse 18, it says, actually, I'm, I'm going to read verse 17. It's Paul's prayer, the, the Ephesian prayer. He says, I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge of him, that the eyes of your understanding will be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. I'm like, oh my goodness. No wonder we need our eyes open. Mm -hmm. We need our eyes of our understanding. Paul had to pray this. I pray that your eyes are opened so that you can see that you have an inheritance and a birthright. Mm -hmm. And that our inheritance is in God. Mm -hmm. That's right. All right. So, this is our inheritance in God. Proverbs says that a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. Right. We already determined that God was good, mm -hmm. right? So I want to come back to this term, Abba, Father. Kind of skipped over that for a second. It's only mentioned three times in the New Testament. I think I did say that. Mm -hmm. But this idea of Abba, Father, and it's Father's Day, right? Mm -hmm. God's our Father. Jesus introduced this cuss, this idea that God's our Father. He said, in this man I pray, our Father who art in heaven. That was kind of a new concept to them. They didn't really address God that way. They addressed God as Elohim, all God, awesome, powerful, mighty God who's out there. And, but they didn't talk to God like, God, you're my daddy. And that's what this Abba Father means. Abba Father means daddy. It means like a sweet connection, right? So, for example, I have three children. My oldest son, Josh, when he was little... I called him Buddy. I still call him Buddy to this day, actually. That was my nickname for him, Buddy, right? He's my buddy, my old buddy. Um, my oldest daughter, Elise, um, Honey. I've called her Honey since she was way high, and I've, I still call her Honey to this day, whenever I talk to her. You know, that's her nickname. Well, my youngest daughter, Sophie, a sweetheart. Now, I didn't purposely intend to call them these names. It just kind of happened and developed, and you know, that's just what it is. And I call Sophie Sweetheart to this day. And it's, nothing is so exciting than coming home from work, having a long day or whatever, and daddy's home, daddy's home, daddy's home, right? It's so awesome, right? Or to have your child call you mommy or daddy, right? It's so different. I remember when my oldest daughter, um, I came home one day from work, she's probably about 10, and she always, daddy, daddy's home, hi daddy, and I come home and she didn't greet me. And I'm like, Where's Elise? You know, is she home? Oh, yeah, she's in her bedroom listening to music or something. I'm like, what? Like, daddy's home. Like, daddy's home, right? Like, it's, it's daddy's home time, right? Like, it's like God coming with Adam, you know? Like, this is our time. I'm coming. I'm home. Where are you? You're not greeting me. What's up? Hey, Dad. Whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Not only is daddy's home not there, I'm just dad now? Oh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Did you remember when your kids started stopped calling you mommy and daddy and it went to mom and dad? Yeah. Like, wow, right? There's something special about daddy. There's something special about mommy. Yeah. 
or mama or papa or whatever that it's it's a term of endearment that is it's sweet and close and, and trusting and intimate mm -hmm. right yes well that's what this term means it's it's abba father that he gave us the spirit of adoption so we can call him abba father and it's redundant in the greek because abba means father and the word for father means father it's a term that paul made up because it was so mind-blowing at the time that, that Abba by itself would just blow people away. So he had to say, like, Abba Father. Like, it's, it's, it's close and sweet and intimate, but it's Daddy. You know, it's like, Abba Father. I didn't grow up with an Abba Father. I, I told you I had to come from a, a middle-class dysfunctional alcoholic <laughs> home, right? I mean, I came up with a lot of names that I was called, you know, and... <laughs> But I don't Amen. remember having a father in that relationship at all. It's just foreign to me. Amen. All right? So I had a hard time when I hear people talk about this growing up as a Christian, mm -hmm. I have a father. Like, that don't mean nothing to me. I don't know what that means. I didn't experience that. Right. Mm -hmm. Again, I understand it conceptually and from education and learning, but I never experienced it toward me. Now, I can experience it toward my children because I decided I'm not going to be anything like them. And, you know, God saved me and helped me change. But um, God's a much better dad than I am. And if I can understand how I love my kids, mm -hmm. right, I can understand God so much better. Right. But that's what this term, Abba Father, means. It's like, but we had to have the spirit of adoption so we can cry out Abba Father. Right? Because right? we, we can't cry Abba Father without that spirit of adoption. Because it doesn't mean the same thing. Right. Like, people who are adopted, like... You know, my wife's adopted, right? And, and she struggles with this feeling rejected, not feeling important, not feeling wanted, right? And being treated different than the siblings who were born naturally, right? Even though her, her parents didn't mean to do it, they, they do it without thinking or realizing it. And I don't think they're trying to exclude her or trying to make her feel different, but they do, right? Uh, it's just different. But this spirit of adoption is different. It's, it's not adoption like American customs understand. It's adoption because in order to be adopted, you have to agree to be adopted. Mm -hmm. So you say, I want to be adopted. And then the other person says, I want you to be part of my family. So all of a sudden, you take on the new name. Mm -hmm. You're taking on a new birth. Mm -hmm. And you are born Amen. again Amen. Yeah. into yeah. God's family. Right. You have God's name. You have God's inheritance. Mm -hmm. You have God's birthright mm -hmm. through faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. And the reason why it's by faith is so it can be the same for everybody. So nobody can be excluded because under the Abrahamic covenant, you had to be circumcised. So if you weren't a male, you were excluded. If you weren't a Hebrew, you were excluded. If you weren't the firstborn, you didn't get the birthright. That's why Esau sold his birthright and why... Um, um, uh, Jacob tricked him out of the inheritance too. Right? It was so important to them. But this is saying, hey, it's by faith, so it can be sure to everybody. Yep. All you gotta do is believe. That's right. Uh -huh. See, some people have a hard time with faith. They think, oh, you're you know, you're saying you don't have faith. No, no, no. Faith is easy. Jesus made it simple. Faith is easy. He did. We just have to believe. That's right. Mm -hmm. Religion makes it difficult. Yes. It makes us have to jump through hoops and tell us we have to do this and do that and the other thing. But Hello. Jesus didn't do that. He said, simply believe. And even the one person, right, who said, I believe, Lord, but help my unbelief. See, unbelief is not the problem. Because he still got what he wanted. Jesus still gave it to him, even though he had unbelief. See, faith is not the absence of unbelief. Faith is the continuity to not give up. Because Jesus said, even if you have faith as a mustard seed, mm -hmm. you'll say to this mountain, be gone, and cast into the sea, and it'll be gone. Mm -hmm. And then he rebuked the disciples for having little faith the next verse. So it like, sounds like a dichotomy. Like, he said, all I have to do is have a little faith, but now you just told me I don't, have, I don't even have a mustard seed? Wait, wait a minute. What is going on here? Right? When we read the Bible like a dictionary, these things don't make sense. But if we read it in the context, what he was saying there, he wasn't saying little faith like size. He was saying... Your faith was small because you gave up. It was small in time, not small in quantity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's good. So he's saying, you gave up too soon. Mm -hmm. oh. That's what he told him. Hey, 
Don't give up, folks. God is a good God. Amen. And He Amen. has adopted you into His family. He has given you a birthright and an inheritance. And your inheritance and birthright is in God. It's hidden in Jesus, in Christ. Amen. He has blessed you with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places through Christ Jesus. You will see over and over and over again the promises and the blessings are linked to faith in Jesus. All we have to do is have faith in Jesus. And God has an inheritance for you. And I'll tell you something else. You know, the same way that Bill Gates, his money, is going to stay on this planet when he dies and go to his heirs. You know, the inheritance that God has for us doesn't do us any good when we die. It's not for the, for the far off and later in heaven. We won't need an inheritance in heaven, folks. The streets are paved with gold. We won't have any problems. There's not going to be any sin there. There's not going to be any sickness. There's not going to be any poverty. There's no problems in heaven. Amen. The inheritance is for right now. We just have to change our thinking. Yes, definitely. Right? Amen. God's a good God. And the Amen. thing I want to share with you today is it's Father's Day and God, happy Father's Day. Amen. I'm a father. Amen. Thank you for adopting us, Amen. putting us into your family. Thank you for giving us a new name. Thank you for giving us a new life, that our old life has passed away, that we've become new creatures in you if we believe in you. Thank you for that, God. Father, I thank you, sir. Father, I pray that you would seal this word in our hearts, Lord God, that you would help us to trust you, that you are our Father. You are our Abba Father, our Daddy God. God, that you want good for us. And you are much better at being good than we are at being bad. Thank you, sir. Thank you, God, for your promises and your blessings. Amen. Um, Amen. Amen. I, you know, I, I like to pray for people. So uh, I'm going to pray for people, but before we do, I think uh, Tony has something else to say. Well, we're going uh, to pray over this uh, offering. And uh, Lord, we just, uh, you bless us, so let us bless you with this offering. And uh, uh, you tell us that we're supposed to tithe, and uh, all the money belongs to you, Lord. So let us give back a little bit of what you've given us. And I just uh, pray that it will be a blessing to you in your name, Jesus. And the, uh, the second basket here is for Ed. And uh, so I'm going to pass one down this aisle. We'll pass it over the other way. Thank you, Evans.